Amen. All right, please open to 1 Kings chapter 13. One of the things that I wanted to mention to you before we start reading is uh, as we move forward now from kind of from this point forward, there's going to be a lot of back and forth going on. You're going to see all kinds of kings coming and going. Um, you remember that Israel has been sectioned off, if you will, to the ten tribes in the north and, uh, and the two tribes uh, in Judah. Each one of those parts of Israel, I guess you could say, had their own kings. So a lot of times when you're doing timelines in, the, in, in this section right here, it's difficult because it won't tell you what year but it will tell you, like, the king of Judah was reigning in his fifth year when the new king of Israel took the throne. So it kind of gives us a little bit of a timeline um, to go by. And it kind of gets difficult, a little bit confusing sometimes, to differentiate, is that king from Israel or is he from Judah? So we're going to do our best to try to um, keep that clear for us to, uh, as we go down through here. So let's open up to chapter 13. And uh, we know some of the things that took place now. They've, they've had this big argument. They've split up. They're, they're sacrificing to idols. They're, uh, things are starting to really come unraveled. And... Jeroboam is ruling, and Rehoboam is also ruling. So we'll pick this up in chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, and he said, O oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places, who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it will be poured out. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard that saying of the man of God, who cried against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him! And then his hand, which he had stretched out toward him, it withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. And the altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So we find this king of Judah, Jeroboam, he's at the altar, he's burning incense, but it doesn't really tell us who he's burning incense to. He's probably burning incense to one of those false gods that they were building all these high places for. He was uh, defacing um, the, the altar by doing that. And we have a very interesting thing that takes place here at the beginning of chapter 13. So this guy, we don't even know who he is. He's a man of God. I guess that's all that matters. <laughs> right? Um, but he's called from God uh, to go to speak to Jeroboam. And he finds Jeroboam at the altar burning incense. He's basically caught him, uh, I would say he's caught him in the act. He's, he's, he's more than likely burning this incense to a false god. And as the man approaches 
uh, Jeroboam, he begins to cry out against the altar. Not so much against Jeroboam at this point. He's crying out against the altar. It's a grievous cry. Um, a mourning, uh, sadness cry. Because what he says is going to be happening here in a moment is a very sad thing. The altar of the Lord is going to split right down the middle. And all of these false gods, they've been, there's ashes on there. There's probably animal remains. Who knows what was down in there. Um, but he cries out against the altar in verse 2. And then he gives the word of God that he was told to bring to the king. Very, very interesting. It's not very often when you have a prophetic reading in the Bible um, that it's specific to a person's name. This is that one of those times that we have right here. Thus says the Lord, a child, behold, <laughs> a child, Josiah, by name, will be born to the house of David. Now, I think if I have my memory right, serves me right, about 250 years later, Josiah is born. Josiah was prophesied to come to the throne over 200 years before he was ever even born, and God calls him by name. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, he could have just said, there's going to be a king that's going to rise up, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do that. Like they did, like we see here with the man of God, who we don't have a clue really who that is. But this particular king who's going to come in the future, 250 years in the future, is going to be named Josiah. Now, th that's happened a few times. Um, it happened when the angel appeared to Mary. And she told him exactly what Jesus' name was going to be. It was all predetermined already. And, of course, Josiah wasn't a Messiah or a Savior or anything like that. He did some really great things, um, but he was just a man. But it just fascinates me that in the prophetic speaking of this prophet, that he would actually know the man's name of Josiah. And one of the things that Josiah is going to do is he's going to take all these false prophets, all of these witchcraft people, all of these prostitutes, all of these false religious leaders, and he's going to burn them on the altar. Their bones will be burned, it says, on the altar. And so he wants to give a little bit of... It's nice to have proof, isn't it? Just so that, just so that Jeroboam knows that this is a word from God... He says, now I'm going to prove that it's coming from God. Because you're going to see the altar split right down the middle. Now, Jeroboam's not very receptive to what's going on here. As a matter of fact, he's probably very angry, taken by surprise. Um, and he reaches out to command that this man of God be arrested. And probably executed if they could have. But as he reaches his hand out, it tells us in verse 4, as he stretched his hand out toward him, it withered up. And he could not pull it back to himself. So he's pointing like this, and it just dried up right there. It just got stiff. Maybe, And he couldn't bring it back to himself. Pretty intense, don't you think? And at the same time, in verse 5, the altar splits apart. And the ashes, you know, the accuracy, the, the detail of this little teeny tiny prophecy right here. He even mentions that the ashes are going to fall out of it. it will, they will be poured out of it. And sure enough, that's what we see happen here. Um, verse 
verse 5, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So how important is it that we are able to distinguish who's telling us the word of the Lord and who's not? That's a pretty important thing to be able to understand, isn't it? Um, obviously, Jeroboam didn't have a clue here um, to see that this truly was a man that was sent from God. Now, I, you know, I, I always think to myself when I see things like this, I have a what if. What if Jeroboam would have repented? What if he would have turned around to the man of God and said, oh man, I have sinned against God. We're going to clean this mess up. We're going to turn back to the living God. You know, it could have changed history. Everything could have been different from that moment on. But this man, his heart is so hardened. We're talking a lot of years that have gone by here. Fifteen or more years have passed since he's been on the throne. That's another thing that's difficult for us to judge is when in his reign, because it doesn't tell us, did this take place? It was far into his reign. And uh, so the king, once he sees his... <laughs> Once he sees his hand and his arm dry, dried up and he can't bring it back into his body, he answered and he said to the man of God, this tells me a lot about Jeroboam's heart, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Now, you would think if Jeroboam had any heart for God whatsoever, he would say, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God to forgive us of all of our sins and, you know, uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, oh, by the way, maybe God could touch me and heal my hand, you know. But he makes no mention of the spiritual depravity um, that he's been exposed to and promoting um, as the leader of the nation to all the people. Every little hill, we're going to read a little bit later, every little hill that they could find, they would build some sort of a, a shrine on it to some fake god. And they would set up little tents there to get you out of the sun. And, and they would go into these things and they would worship. And most of the time they would have prostitutes in there. And, of course, you would pay, and that money would go back to the king, and it was a, a, a legal cult um, that had been going on for a long time in, in Judah. So he asked the man of God, please ask God to heal me. And so the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Now, there's another issue that I have. If I was the Lord God, after all this man had done, I'd probably want to make his whole body dry up. I wouldn't want to heal him. I wouldn't want to gift him with anything. I would rather uh, take care of him right on the spot. I'm glad I'm not the one that makes that call. Because God I still has a plan for this king. He heals him, but this is only a very, very temporary stay, if you will, um, to God's judgment. And so the king said to the man of God, now he wants to be friends with him. Come home with me and refresh yourself and I'll give you a reward. Ooh, trying to entice the man of God. But the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread or drink water or return by the same way that you came. So he's very clear with the orders that God had given him for wherever he called him out of um, to go up to Bethel there, somewhere in Judah, and he also told him, I don't want you hanging out with this guy or any of them. I don't want you fellowshipping with these people. I don't want you to be around them because 
they're contaminated with evil. They, they worship demons. We're not going to go in there and have a friendship with these people. So don't even take a drink of water. Have nothing to do with them. And when you go, when you leave, when you're done, take a different route. Probably to protect him from being hunted down. So, we kind of move into a kind of a, a secondary story within the story here now. It says there was an old prophet, not the one that we just talked about. This is a different one. He's an old prophet, and he dwelt in Bethel. And his sons came, and he told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And they also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went, who came from Judah. So he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. And he went after the man of God, and he found him sitting under an oak. And then he said to them, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. Same sales pitch, right? And once again, this is an old prophet who has probably become corrupt. He's probably in on all of this idol worship along with his sons. It looks like at the beginning, maybe he's a good guy. Maybe he's going to go and try to help this man of God out. And so he chases him down. Now, if you're the enemy and a person of power comes into your little playground and begins to have an effect on what you're doing, the enemy is going to want to silence that. He's going to want to destroy that. He's going to want to remove it so that there's no longer any obstacles in the way. So I feel as though now, well, we'll see this as we read further, that um, Satan was using this old prophet to try to snuff out the prophet of God. God's voice had been heard. God had made himself known uh, there at the altar. And it's almost as though God is saying, I have been watching way too long. I'm done watching. I need to act. And so this false prophet hunt, catches up with him. He says, come on with me and eat bread. He says, I cannot return with you or go in with you. Neither can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For I've been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread, drink water, or return by going the same way you came. He repeats the commandment that God gave to him. And the old prophet said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with you to your house, so that he may eat bread and drink water. And then we have a side note. He was lying to him. And so the man of God went back with him. And he ate bread in his house and he drank water. Once again, we see what's going on here. I am a prophet just like you. I'm a Christian too. Right? You know, there are groups out there. They have to remind themselves every once in a while. They, they have to have a bumper sticker that, that tells the world that their little cult that they're Christians because they are under they are under scrutiny for their doctrine, which is from the pit of hell, by the way. Um, can I just say it? Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons, there are two that fall into this category. Sorry if I offended you anybody out there in the world, um, but they're cults. 
they're very similar. One of the biggest things they have in common is that they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Whatever group or organization denies the deity of Christ is a cult. A lot of people define a cult by saying, well, it's a, a man that has a lot of power and he gets a lot of people to do whatever he wants them to do and he kind of captures them in his deception. That is a symptom of a cult. But the root of a cult is to dilute who Jesus truly is. For example... You may not have known this. It may shock you. The LDS group, they believe and they teach that Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. They teach that Jesus, like Lucifer and like the angels in heaven, that Jesus was a created being. That's just two of the things that they teach. That's one of the base of their doctrine right there. The base of our doctrine is Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth. He's God Almighty. You know, he's, he's part of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. And by the way, they don't believe in the Trinity either. But they will come and they will knock on your door and they will say, I'm a Christian just like you. And we got some great programs for your family. You know, uh, we got youth groups. We got, you know, all this stuff. Camping trips. Boy Scouts of America. We got it all going on. And people who don't know any better would go, wow, that sounds really cool. Sounds like they really got it together. I'm going to go check that out. Unknowing that they're investigating a cult. But that's how easy it is for us to be, or no, I wouldn't say us, for people to be deceived. What was the problem there? Well, the problem was they didn't know God's word. If that person that was on the inside of that door would have known his Bible, he would have been able to recognize what these people are right away as soon as he started learning about their belief system. Because they don't know God's word, it makes them vulnerable to false prophets. Because they don't know the word of God, it makes them vulnerable to cults, to demons. You know, Paul talks about this in the New Testament when he says, even Satan himself can transform himself into an angel of light. Um... I've always wondered about this Moroni guy. He's the one that appeared and started this whole LDS thing. Perhaps he was an imposter posing as an angel of light and deceived Mr. Smith. And that's why this whole process got started in the first place. Because Mr. Smith didn't know the word. As a matter of fact, if Mr. Smith knew anything... He was all caught up in some other stuff. He was uh, really big in, in, in uh, another organization um, that he had been kicked out of, by the way, the Masons, because he believed in plurality of wives, um, and they didn't believe that, and he wanted to do that, so they told him, you're out of here, excommunicated him. And then when this Moroni fellow shows up, he tells Joe that God is that God detests all the churches in the earth. All of them. It's interesting, during that particular time in history, one of the greatest revivals that ever took place on the East Coast was going on at this very time. God was blessing abundantly. This word did not come from the Lord. Just like this word right here did not come from the Lord. I'm sickened by these churches, and Joe, I'm going to use you to start the kingdom all over again. You're going to be my guy. Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty appealing. So our prophet, our man of God here, he falls for this. He should have known better. He was very discerning um, 
earlier, but now for some reason he has been deceived by this man. And he goes back home with him. And it is a terminal mistake. So now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. So now the word of the Lord has come to this old prophet and he cries out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, this is what the Lord says, because you disobeyed the word of the Lord and you have not kept the commandments which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, you ate bread, you drank water in the place of which the Lord said, eat no bread, drink no water, your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Your body is not going to make it home. You will not be married in the family plot. So after he had eaten bread and drank, he saddled the donkey for him. And the prophet that he, for the prophet whom he had brought back. Now when he was gone, this man of God, a lion met him on the road and killed him. Didn't take very long for that to happen. And his corpse was thrown down on the road. And the donkey stood by it. And the lion also stood by the corpse. Interesting. The lion killed the prophet, but he did not consume him. And he did not consume the donkey, the, the donkey either. So they're both just standing there looking down at this guy who's been mauled by this lion. He's laying in the road and he's dead. Now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, it's the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him into the, delivered him to the lion which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his sons, saying, saddle the donkey for me again. So they saddled it. <clears throat> and then he went and he found his corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid the corpse in his own tomb. And they mourned over him, saying, Oh, alas, my brother. So this prophet, old prophet, not really, uh, not really clear where his heart was, but he does something here that really is telling. He goes and scoops up this man of God, and he takes him home, and he puts him in his own tomb. Now, why would you think he would do that? I think he did it as an insurance policy, maybe. I think he did it knowing maybe that if I've got this prophet in the tomb, when I go there and die, I'll be in the presence of this prophet. Thus, I'll be protected and I'll have his power and perhaps I will be with God, whatever. Sad part about it is it went exactly the way the words were said. He never made it home. He got buried in someone else's tomb. And so it was after he buried him. He spoke to his sons. See, this, is, this shows us an a insight into this guy's heart. When I'm dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar, altar in Bethel and against the shrines on the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. So this guy knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that this truly was a real prophet from God. Why would he deceive him? 
Why would he tempt him or test him to come home with him to find himself later on suffering the consequences for it? Footnote. Samaria had not been yet named or invented at this time in history. Commentators are saying that this Samaria is to show us the location, but it was not Samaria yet. So it was added by the writer um, of this book to give us a geographical position. So after this event, verse 33, Jeroboam, Jeroboam, hard head, hard heart, <sighs> he did not turn from his evil way. But again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him. And he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. His whole lineage, his whole bloodline, all of his children would be destroyed, exterminated from the face of the earth. So at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Please arise and disguise yourself, that they may not recognize you as the wife of Jeroboam. And go to Shiloh. Indeed, Ahijah the prophet is there, who told me that I would be king over this people. That's back in chapter 11. Also take with you ten loaves, some cakes, a jar of honey, and go to him. And he will tell you what will become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh, came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Here is the wife of Jeroboam coming to ask you something about her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall say to her, For it will be when she comes in that she will pretend to be another woman. So before she even gets there, the jig's up. Before she even gets to the door, he already knows who she is. So it was when Abijah heard the sound of her footsteps as she came to the door. He said, come in, wife of Jeroboam. What a surprise, huh? Why do you pretend to be another person? For I have been sent to you with bad news. Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel. Because I exalted you from among the people, I made you ruler over my people Israel. And I tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and I gave it to you. And yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all of his heart, to do only what was right in my eyes. But you have done more evil than all who were before you. For you have gone and made for yourself other gods, molded images, to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every male in Israel, bond and free. I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuge until it is all gone. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam and dies in the city. And the birds of the air will eat whoever dies in the fields. For the Lord has spoken. 
<laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. <clears throat> Arise, therefore, go to your own house. And when your feet enter the city, the child shall die. And all of Israel will mourn for him and bury him. For he is the only one of Jeroboam who shall come to the grave. Because in him there is found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. God saw something in this child. Perhaps innocence, perhaps his young age. Perhaps he hadn't been converted over to some of these terrible practices at this point. And he goes on to say, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day. What? Even now. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He'll uproot Israel from this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and he will scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who sinned and who made Israel sin. Wow. Want to be a leader over a massive amount of people? There's a responsibility there, isn't there? There's an accountability that, that God is holding to this man for for corrupting the people. You know, earlier we read where he had made these golden calves and they were worshiping all these golden calves. And we, right away, you think of Moses and Aaron and how Aaron did that. The calves were a very uh, a common form of worship in uh, Egypt. And it was just accepted. It was just part of how they worshipped. And what was happening there was they were trying to combine Jehovah, worship of Jehovah, with this Egyptian God. So here again, we see all these years later that it happens once again. That it still has a, a profound influence on the people. And they accept it. And it was probably a lot of partying and a lot of fun and a lot of sensual things and perverted things. And people were drawn to it. The king said it was okay. Come and this is the God that we'll worship. He's the one that brought us out of Egypt. Let's worship him. So everybody in Israel, it says here, sinned. I kind of wonder how in the world God is going to deal with our country. So it's Pride Month, you guys. All month. And they're having parades all over the United States. I remember when they used to do this years and years ago. And it was just a parade. And they were out there with their signs. Now it's a big event. I saw some film of it a couple days ago. And you got the parents there with all their children sitting in little beach chairs all along the road. And you got these people marching down the road. Some of them women have their tops off. I think they're men, but they think they're women. Anyway, they got their tops off. Men are riding bicycles up and down there, right in front of these children, and they're butt naked. And they're chanting a chant as they walk down the street. And they were saying, we are queer, we are here, and we're coming for your children. That's what they were chanting as they walked down the street. And everybody's cheering. And they're throwing candy. And it's just a great thing. 
I looked at that and I thought, oh my gosh. Judgment has got to come. It has to come. Pretty scary stuff. We just go around in circles as a species. We just do the same stupid things over and over again. We're going to see that with this whole nation of people over and over again, making the same stupid mistakes. And here we are living in a time right now where it's almost as wicked and evil and debauched as it was during this time. I think the only thing missing is some of the churches to start setting up some worship shrines for some of these people to go in and participate in. So Jeroboam's wife in verse 17 arose. She departed and came to Tirzah. When she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. And they buried him. And all of Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to his servant Ahijah, the prophet. So this little boy was the only person in all of Jeroboam's family who had a proper burial. Everybody else was consumed by beasts whether they were birds or wild dogs. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, indeed they're written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the period that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years. So he rested with his fathers. And then Nadab, his son reigned in his place. So that's the end of that king. His son now takes over 22 years on the throne. Now Solomon reigned 40 years on the throne. And the kingdom gets handed down to his son who reigned in his place. Now we're going to switch over to Judah. From the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom. Verse 21. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess. So Naamah was a direct descendant of Cain. Closer, a direct descendant of Ammon. Thus you have Ammonites who did evil to the children of Israel when they were in needing help. And they turned on them. These are the descendants of Cain. Pretty amazing that these same families are still at it today, right? These same two people, although they've splintered off into different groups and stuff, but the same battle is still going on. The um, most holy place for Islam in Mecca and the men are required at least once in their lifetime to go there on a journey and when they get there down in the middle you've probably seen this thing before it's a giant cube a big black cube and in one of the corners of the cube is a stone a black stone that they believe came from heaven. That Muhammad uh, came down from heaven in this spot right here. Now you remember it was on the Temple Mount that he went back to heaven. But he arrives in Mecca at this spot. And 
um, they believe that Abraham and Ishmael built this structure. Not Abraham and Isaac, but Ishmael. So, again, they have the same father as the Jews, but the brothers split off into two people groups, which split off into more people groups. But way, way, way back then, it's interesting to look at that and, and, and to realize that they truly believe with all of their heart that Isaac stole the birthright. And that's thus you have the problems going on over there that we've had. So literally they're cousins, I guess you could say maybe. And you know what? I think that, uh, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, but I really believe that there's going to come a time when their eyes are going to be opened to the truth. I think that they're going to be reunited with their family, with their proper family, um, I hope. Because true, raw Islam is a very peaceful religion. They've got things wrong. They've got the wrong descendant. But some of them are really, really good people. And uh, they're just in the wrong side of the family tree. So and just food for thought. Just. So Rehoboam now, he's on the throne. Um, he's reigning. His mom's name is Naama. And here we go. Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. This is what they did. For they also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, wooden images on every hill and under every green tree. And there were also perverted persons in the land. The King James uses the word sodomites in the land. And they did according to all of the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now you have a little bit of insight into that culture. Very much like the culture that we're dealing with right now. It became the norm. It was accepted. It was just part of the way life is, you know. Some people are like that. Some are not. It's all okay. It's all good. Express yourself, right? It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the gold shields which Solomon had made. And then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. And whenever the king would enter the house of the Lord, the guards would carry them and then bring them back into the guard room. So now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all of their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Naama, an Ammonitus. And then Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. So now we're starting to see this pattern begin to develop. Each one of these nations becomes sicker and sicker. 
It's interesting that when we look at the end of Solomon's life, it said during Solomon's reign there was no war. It was a good economy. People were happy. People were satisfied. People were prospering because of who was on the throne. And when Solomon dies and these perverts start taking leadership in the land, war breaks out again. Trouble breaks out again. I'm sure economic problems followed. Many people dying on the battlefield and they're fighting their own blood, their own family they're at war with. All the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So we remember Rehoboam, he, uh, Jeroboam was there for uh, 22 years or so. That's a long time. And then we find now at the end of our chapter here that once again that same bloodline is still on the throne. This new king, Abijam, reigns in his place, but look who he's descended from. Naamah the Ammonitus, the same as his, fa his brother. So, uh, or father. So you still got this same uh, corrupt bloodline sitting on the throne. Actually, in, each, uh, in Israel and Judah. So, what do we walk away from with all this stuff? What do we, what do we do with it? I mean, do we remember that God is long suffering? That He gives chance after chance after chance for people to repent. The people can harden their hearts so much against God that it doesn't matter what He does. They won't turn away from their evil ways. I think that can happen. I think that's the danger um, in some of the rebellion that, that you see here in the Scripture and in our world. That there are people's hearts that have become so hard, so perverse, um, that they'll never be capable of surrendering or repenting. These people weren't. And it's sad to, to see where we live, our nation, copying them. And they're not even knowing that they're copying them, right? Um, so, we have to walk away thinking to ourselves, you know, God is on the throne. We're His people. He has a great plan for us. We're living in a very evil world, a dangerous world, a wicked world. But we're the only light that the world has, so God wants us to shine. I don't think he wants us hiding. I don't think he wants us afraid to speak the truth. And to be honest with you, sometimes I get a little bit afraid to want to think to myself, you need to watch what you say because you're going to have repercussions because of what you say. Well, do I need to live in fear like that? Do I speak the truth? Do I water it down? Do I keep silent for fear? No. Not going to do that. So here, we will not hesitate to call it out for what it is. Right? Amen? All right, let's pray. Let's pray.